Hi, everybody. I'm Branko Damianac. Uh, thank you for joining uh, XA2 webinar. We'll start with a brief introduction and very general background. Most of the presentation will be actually discussing a tutorial example, including demonstration of the model setup, and then we'll show some of the results at the end. If you have uh, questions during the presentation, please uh, submit them through the window, which is illustrated here on the on the right side. And uh, we'll do our best to answer the questions within allotted time by 11 uh, central time. And if there are more questions, we'll probably try to stay a bit longer. So Excite is based on a new methodology uh, that has been developed and applied by uh, Itasca. It's called the uh, synthetic rock mass, and the first implementation was in PFC. Two main components are so-called bonded particle model. So the synthetic model, uh, which uh, consists of a bonded particle, spherical, or this shape, and we found that such a model kind of well represents uh, the formation and damage of a, of a brittle rock. And the other component of synthetic rock mass, or SRM, our smooth joint model, or a way to represent uh, discontinuity or introduce them in the bonded particle model. So SRM and its ingredients components are kind of illustrated in, in this slide. So on the on the left, left side, we have this assembly of spherical particles. So that's bonded particle model. And as I said, bonded particle model actually quite well represents the formation and damage fracturing of uh, intact brittle rock and then on the right side is discrete fracture network and the uh, fractures in uh, SRM can be represented using discrete fracture network or it can be represented deterministically as uh, as a folds or major structures with specified and defined uh, geometry so what are the general advantages of uh, SRM not only uh, considering applications to hydraulic fracturing first it's completely physics based approach it represents dominant mechanisms of failure of the fractured rock masses, meaning it actually represents fracture, slip and opening of the fractures. And then also it represents uh, cracking of the rock bridges or intact rock between the fractures. So if we have correct representation of the FN and we carry out a standard test on a small scale samples to characterize strength of the intact rock or, or the fracture, with SRM, we have a, a rational physics-based model which can represent behavior of fractured rock mass, including the uh, scale effect. So we don't have to resort on uh, some kind of empirical tools to degrade the laboratory testing data in order to come up with the properties of the of the rock mass. The so Excite actually is not based on a PFC. Instead, it uses the lattice. And lattice is a quasi a random array of nodes and spring in uh, 3D. So here, the, here is the cartoon illustrating Excite in a 2D. The important thing to understand is, although we, in this cartoon, we illustrate that every node is connected with a single spring, in reality, actually, there are two springs. So one is normal, as shown here, and then the other, other one is in shear. So, the main advantage of, let's say, lattice compared to PFC is that it is computationally more efficient at the cost of somehow ignoring some uh, physics, which we believe for hydraulic fracturing is not important, like, for example, uh, large scale dis uh, displacement and uh, consequently the issues with, uh, you know, contact detection and up updates of, uh, of uh, geometry. So by using lattice, we are able to actually run these uh, excite models which can include tens of millions of particles on you know laptop pcs another advantage of lattice and the p brick approach for uh, creating the model geometry is that we have we can actually avoid kind of tedious step of uh, model calibration because with the lattice and p bricks we, we are actually able to pre-calculate uh, the calibration factors and then uh, just apply our scaling laws as we change the the resolution which is used in particular models so here is a, just again a couple of cartoons which kind of illustrate how the lattice and the model discretization work and again it's based on the p break it's kind of uh, 
uh, packing of the nodes based on actually uh, PFC uh, 3D. And that P brick, the, the nice thing about P brick is that we can actually fill the space in a three dimensions by basically replicating the P bricks in all three coordinate directions. And then when we uh, define uh, or we, when we try to create the model of, for particular geometry, here I, we provide an illustration of the of slope. We basically just trim a lattice to the actual geometry that we want to model. So the, the cost of, of this approach is that geometry of the lattice doesn't perfectly conform to the, uh, the model geometry. But the advantage is that creation of the model is very fast and very easy and completely transparent to the user. And as, as I've shown here with the two uh, examples of resolution one and resolution two, uh, as we refine the resolution, uh, the error due to not conforming exactly to the geometry is gradually uh, reduced. So the lattice is used to to do simulation of deformation and fracturing and so on. But then the other essential component of any model for simulation of hydraulic fracturing is, uh, is a model of fluid flow, particularly flow in the fractures. And here I'm trying to, again, another cartoon in which I'm trying to illustrate the uh, relation of the geometry or of the model for uh, simulation of the uh, mechanical model and model for the for the fluid flow. So, for example, so these are the nodes of the of the lattice connected by the springs, and uh, as I mentioned, these springs represent the formability of the rock. So they are, they are calibrated to match, you know, given stiffness and strength and so on. Now, when those springs uh, break, we basically assume that there is a micro crack formed at at the center of the spring perpendicular to the direction of the spring and in the same time that micro crack in our flow model acts as a fluid element which uh, contains the fluid and at the level of the fluid element we do calculation of pore pressure change and also the aperture change now if these fluid elements are relatively close to each other within a tolerance which is function of overall resolution of the model we then assume that those uh, fluid elements are uh, collected by a pipe and then the the pipe and their apertures are calibrated in order to in similar way the mechanical model is calibrated the the pipes and their apertures are calibrated to match overall permeability of the fractures of, of a certain enough. And of course, the essential thing for simulation of hydraulic fracturing is that there is full and tight hydromechanical coupling, which means that fracture permeability depends on, on aperture. And aperture is actually a result of the formation of the mechanical model. The fluid pressure inside the fractures acts on a, on a solid model, causing deformation and potentially a failure, slipper, a slipping, and opening of the joint. And then there is also this effect of uh, Andrein uh, pressure change, where the pressures in the flow model change as a result of mechanical deformation, uh, uh, volumetric strain of the mechanical model, even without any pore pressure dissipation. So what are the general advantages of X site compared to other, let's say, conventional uh, hydraulic fracturing simulators? First. There's no, we don't make any assumption regarding the fracture shape uh, geometry, and you will see that in some of the examples that we are going to present today. So the code solves general interaction between hydraulic fractures, but also between hydraulic fractures and pre-existing joints. And the code can simulate hydraulic fracturing in heterogeneous and isotropic and, and a fractured media. And uh, the summary or overview of Excite, it is a special purpose code for simulation hydraulic fracturing and includes a number of functionalities that allow actually simulation of actual uh, uh, field design and, and field operation, including simulation of wellbore hydraulics, uh, uh, perforation pressure drop at different scales, uh, propane transport placement and effect of uh, propane on fracture closure, a simulation of complex uh, pumping schedules, injection rate histories, placement of the diverters, and so on. So this is very, very brief uh, introduction, but if you want to learn more, uh, there is a link to the site that you can visit. And we'll start with a tutorial example. So this is not true uh, field case study, because 
sometimes it's difficult to obtain, obtain those because of uh, confidentiality and so on. But we created a model which we believe is fairly realistic, representative of typical conditions and, uh, and field operations. So the, the model is, its size is illustrated on the upper uh, right corner. The, the fractures are contained by a stress barrier within two layers, approximately 200 meters height. In some of the simulations, we explicitly represent uh, DFN. And again, DFN is also contained within those two layers. So the plot on the lower right side actually is a, is a plan view. And it, it kind of illustrates actually DFN, which includes three fracture sets. And we assume that all fractures are uh, dipping at 90 degrees. In terms of the stimulation, we include two wells, each well with uh, two stages, and there are four perfusion clusters uh, per stage. Uh, we inject for 90 minutes slick water in each stage, and the the the, the clusters are kind of arranged in some kind of uh, uh, zipper pattern. And we actually carried out simulation of five cases. So there is a base case where we do simulation without any DFN. And then there are four cases with DFN. However, we carry out some sensitivity analysis with respect to the fracture strength and with respect to the uh, fracture permeability, meaning that although we specify the fracture and certain uh, aperture of the fracture in the in situ initial conditions. If we assume that fra uh, that fractures are impermeable, that means that uh, there will be no pore pressure dissipation in a fracture until they fail, you know, due to stress changes, either in a, in a tension or, or a shear. And the next part of this presentation is actually a recorded tutorial where we'll actually Marilio will run through the actually demonstration of the setup of the model for, for this uh, problem. And then in the end, we will show you uh, real quick some of the results. I'll be presenting how to set up Excite model. So let's go from here. You input the length of the model. The height. And um, the width. And this is a, a real case example. I'm going to put the sketch model here. I'm going to take out some of these features here and then just put it like in a non-perspective mode. So we have the model here, uh, origin right there. Then the next thing that we are going to do, we I'm going to show you, this is um, preloaded. Um, we have preloaded some, some um, data. So for conductivity curves, uh, this used to, um, uh, based on the uh, proton concentration, we can find the, con and, uh, and based on a given stress, you can find the conductivity for, for uh, abrupt um, fracture. Um, the other thing that we have, we have a database of uh, fluids. You can enter your own fluid here. Um, and also we have a database of materials and you can enter um, your own data, uh, your own materials here. Um, since I have a model that it's already uh, ready to go, um, I, I, I will load it um, and then we, we go from there. So the next thing that we want to do, we uh, based on, on the materials that we have, we want to add um, uh, the different um, 
materials to the model. So um, this already, I have already have that preloaded. So um, so for this, um, um, so several different materials here. Um, I'm gonna do something here pretty quickly so you guys can see how this thing works. I'm gonna put a, a larger resolution here and just um, run the model to zero seconds. So you guys can take a look at and take a look. This is just a quick um, way of initializing the modern check for the materials. So here we can see the different materials in the model. So basically, again, I go to features, sims, and uh, I'm just defining them as an infinite plane, and then define the, the coordinate. And here I define the thickness of the sim. We can have different stresses in the material, you know, other than the um, principal stresses are defined on the model. The principal stress defined in the model are here. I'll reset the model right there, so go back to zero. Then, once I have the materials defined, I'm, I want to import some DFN from, uh, we can have different formats. Uh, we have fragment XF and some uh, ITASCA format files. I have some DXF files prepared. I have three DFN, so, and then I'll read. And then here, I know that that's a joint. I can import or either a sim or a joint. So I will import joint, and I can give an aperture for that joint. And um, I can define the um, stiffness if the joint is impermeable or not, and then click OK and import. OK, so now the model has the seams and the joints. And uh, this is the um, side view. If you want to see the top view you, with the plane view, you just rotate on the um, X direction, zero to zero degrees, and then you have the, um, so this is the, uh, the DFN. Now, uh, we go back to resources, and um, I've already covered the conductivity curve. So now we can have a database of uh, cluster designs. I've already had one that I put it here. So, my cluster design one is going to be spherical. Um, it's going to have a radius of three, uh, nine perforations. We're going to have pressure loss on it. And then uh, we're going to install joints. Those joints, they work like um, uh, initial cracks. Um, um, and then uh, we have an aperture. And the radius factor here is going to it's going to take, um, um, it's going to multiply the radius of three, so the joints, they're going to be circular, um, uh, 4.5 meters, the radius. And then I can I can check here what kind of histories I, I want to track. So I'm going to track the uh, cluster uh, pressure history. We can have like volume and drop and so forth, so rate and so forth and so on. So I have that, close. Then I go back to resources, and then I'm going to do a stage design. I have two stages, and um, I, I'm, my stage is based 
S1 is based on um, on cluster design C1. So if I have several, I have a drop down here. I have four clusters per stage. The spacing between them is 70 meters. And then I want to, um, to install um, resolution domain around them. And they are going to be uh, um, in the direction of the uh, of the minimum stress, and um, I also um, I want to I have to I, I'll explain how the um, uh, resolution um, um, domains they work. So basically, uh, in the far field, we can use like um, a, a more coarse resolution. So close to the area of, of the one of the tail, the fracture, we we um, we use um, a, a finer resolution. Um, so in this case here, I can gradually um, create resolution domains um, going towards the, the, the far field resolution. Um, this way, we have more accuracy in in in. In the simulation, so and, and then there is one more. So basically, um, I will go from the inner resolution out. I will have two more resolution domains, and they are going to be the resolution um, is going to increase by 1.5, and the dimension of the box is going to increase by 1.5. Differently here. Stage design. I'm going to delete this guy, and I'll clone this, and I'll call it C2, S2. I mean, we have the um, what we need to create um, the wells and 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 the stages. So um, I have um, predetermined here um, two different wells. Um, I can show you how it works. Um, so basically, um, I have to define um, this was defined in, in the vertical through vertical depth. Uh, so I have two points. Um, And basically, they are they are the 180 meters, and they go from um, that's the position um, going. Uh, let me go back here. So here, um, so. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, so north is in this direction, east west in this direction. So Going back to boreholes, um, so basically you you define pretty much the true vertical depth um, input here uh, for both two points, and then you define the stages that you are going to have um, here. So basically, um, we we select stage design one here. That's the name, we put the name, and that's the measure depth um, for the first one. And here is the measure depth for the second one. What we can do here is this. I can delete this guy. So I have one well, and then I'm going to create a second well. Created two, so. I'll delete one. 
So here I'm going to call this WH2. And then here the difference would be this guy is going to be a 600. So I'm going to build this guy used through that. I'm not using global coordinate. So there you go. Oh, the, um, okay. So the resolution domain here should cover that the entire thing. So now I'm going to build this guy. So now I have the wells and I have the, um, the stages. Now I go to borehole, so I have the two wells there. And I can see um, we don't have, here we, we, have, we add the uh, pumping schedule. Uh, here I have, um, I have two stages and um, um, eight, eight clusters and then you can see here automatically in inherit all the um, all the properties that are defined in the cluster stage okay now um, and also uh, we we added the resolution there automatically we had the uh, joints there automatic the initial cracks are there the uh, hard to see here but they are there well, actually they, they are not turned off yeah they are right there so everything looks fine and then finally we have histories all the all the stage pressure of the 32 um, um, clusters are there so at this point here I'm gonna save my work just to make sure that uh, if I made a mistake I have a uh, fall back now we're going to build two things um, we're going to build um, the, the pumping schedule and then we also are going to build the um, how we're going to process um, this so now I go back to resources and I have the pumping schedule and I have the simulation sequence so the pumping schedule I have already defined a, a pumping schedule here so basically I have slick water uh, for two seconds I, I pump with this rate here and then for 58 seconds I'll pump with a different rate and then for the remainder a reminder of the um, of the simulation. I'll, 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 I'll use this proper concentration. So that's the um, and I call PS1 and slick water. So this is uh, my pumping schedule. Now um, we are going to take a look at the simulation sequence design. So I have several of them. Um, um, I'm going to select this one here. Uh, so basically, um, I, I I can use adapter resolution or not if I um, um, and then um, I will use adapter resolution. So basically, if I use adapter resolution, let me go back here. If I use adapter resolution. Um, so suppose I'm stimulating um, stage one. The the background resolution for the rest of the model. The, the, the rest of the model is going to have background resolution, except for the first stage, and and, and this is speeds up pretty much the um, the simulation time. Um, so I. I I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna apply the adapter resolution um, 
if you want to see um, the micro cracks per stage, I recommend in, uh, in increasing the, the um, micro crack counter. Um, after this stage, after this step here, I'm going to save the state of the model. Then I want to equilibrate the model for two seconds. And also I'm going to save the state. Now here is the pumping schedule. That's where we make the connection between the um, between the um, what's going to be pumped, what's going in that um, in that in this stage. So I'm going to use PS1, and um, um, in some cases we may add the version balls. I mean, be, so in that it's not going to be the case. And we're going to be going to be running uh, because of using slick water. We're going to be running using the uh, the toughness dominate red region. Um, so that's my pumping schedule right there. Now, when I'm done, um, I want to, uh, okay, if we, we, when I'm done, if we reset the pressure to zero, this works like a, a shut in of the, um, of that stage. And then after that, I want to calibrate for two seconds. I want to save the stage and I, sh I want to allow the temperature to change. So now I have my um, my SS1. So this is how I'm going to be using them through the model. Um, now, uh, so basically, I'm, I, if, if you if you have a different way to simulate, we we, we that's how we put them. So, but I'm going to simulate all four of them with the same um, pumping schedule. Uh, so now, finally, um, I have the simulation sequence. So you can see here, I have four, four diff for each stage, I have to define the, uh, the simulation sequence. So, um, so let me delete one of them here so you guys can see how it works. So I'm going to delete this guy. And then I'm going to, let me just check this one. Yeah, these all of them using PS1. Yeah, I'm just going to make sure that they use PS1. Okay, so um, so now I'm going to, I'm going to add a new one. I'm selecting uh, the simulation sequence SS1. So now everything was copied from that simulation sequence, this guy here, except now we have to connect a railway stage. I double click this guy. Um, I'm going to use pump schedule S1, and then I'm going to add, um, it's going to be well number two to stage number three. Then I'm going to save that, save, save. So now I have my simulation sequence for all the stages. Now I'm going to build the model. So I'm going to say yes. So now I go here to borehole and I check this guy and you can see that um, the stages are there. So this starts at 2 and starts again at 10 seconds. Um, the same is going to be for this. It starts at 5 and 16. So everything is there. And finally, this is the, um, the sequencing in which this thing is going to be executed. So I'll have 2 seconds, mechanical only. And then I'll have... Um, uh, 5,400 seconds of um, of stimulation, and then two seconds be shot in, and then um, we have four more seconds here of equilibration, and then we go back. So that's it. So now we save the model. Um, I'm going to call it. Um,
You can see pumping schedule. And that's it. We should have the model ready to go. Um, I, I loaded the um, result of uh, the simulation of this model. And here I'm presenting the plan view of the model. And those are the fracture created. Um, as you can see here, um, the stage, the last stage, has dominated the um, has uh, interfused all the other uh, fractures, um, and then this stage two here, uh, this cluster was not um, stimulated at all. You can see um, that um, because of uh, stress and prop, yeah, I, I mean uh, 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 mechanical and uh, hydraulic properties. Uh, of the DFN, the joint, I mean, the fractures didn't uh, grow as we expected. I also loaded the same model in which um, we do not have the, the DFN. And here you can see that um, the, uh, the fracture has grown properly and, um, and then some of the um, uh, you can see the tortuosity here too, you know, the reflex of the um, shadow stress and some of the, uh, the um, um, states, they do not um, have interference, interference with other um, stages. So this is the side view of the model without the DFN. And um, as you can see, um, the fracture is bounded by the um, stress barriers of um, of those layers and um, the growth here, um, it's about um, 80, uh, 850 meters. Um, I'm gonna give, show you a um, isometric view of the pressure of the um, fractures so you can see how um, they kind of, um, the trajectories, how they, they go apart. And now going back to the model with the DFN, I just want to show the um, the pressure history for um, for the several clusters. Well, this is the um, the plain view of the model with the DFNs, and um, I'm gonna just show you how it looks in an isometric view. So you can see uh, the effect of um, of the um, the FM, and this is the FM that was not uh, stimulated at all. So these are the, the FM that is stimulated. So Franco, I will now be retraining uh, you to be the presenter. Okay, so let me share right screen. Okay, so. Actually, Morelli really already kind of showed you some of the results from the model. So I'll, I'll go real quick, maybe more systematically. First, we're showing the results from the model without the DFN, and Morelli really already kind of showed you and even rotated the model. We're showing them here in a, in, a, in a plan view. So first, the results after first stage. So this is the first stage on the first well. So what we see is that although we inject in a four, perforation clusters, actually only three clusters uh, propagate the fractures. And it's kind of interesting that uh, two clusters actually propagate only with one wing and they go on in opposite direction. And then one cluster propagate fracture in, in, a, in a both directions. <clears throat> and then one cluster doesn't propagate fracture at all. And that's kind of similar what people observe actually in the field. And then we see Injection pressure history roughly around uh, uh, 10 megapascal. Now, if you go to a stage two, there's kind of interesting response, which we believe is due to kind of near field effect of the uh, uh, of the uh, fracture created by a uh, first stage, where the fracture actually propagated very close to the cluster of the second stage, resulting in this relatively high pressure. But then that high pressure drops, and you can see if you compare. Uh, geometry of the fractures between these two states that actually the 
stage two kind of takes over one of the fractures created by uh, stage one and even propagates it a bit further in the other direction. Then we have a stage three and a kind of similar pattern, you know, actually three out of uh, four clusters propagate the fractures and they go asymmetrically switching sides. And the pressure history is again shown here. We kind of see gradual increase. And, and again, these are net pressures. So what we see that the, the net pressure kind of gradually increase with the progress of uh, 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 stimulation along the stages. I'm not going to uh, show all four cases with the DFN. I'll just show two extreme bounding cases, uh, case one and, and case four. Case one is basically the weakest fractures permeable. And again, what you've seen maybe also from a, a Morelia's presentation, it's kind of interesting to look at this where the, in this case, the, the, some uh, clusters actually propagate the fractures, but then some of those fractures right away are arrested by pre-existing joints. And then basically from that point on is diffusion or reactivation of the DFN. Uh, and then stage two. So now response is quite different. We don't have these very long hydraulic fractures, but then in this case, the fracture pore pressures propagate much further. Another interesting observation is that we see the uh, gradually with the DFN, basically gradually increasing pressures, which we don't get with analytic solutions for uh, uh, fracturing in a homogeneous continuous medium. And then the fourth case. So now if you go to uh, case, Four, which is kind of case of uh, strongest joints uh, with uh, with the DFN, the response is a little bit different. So we have more actually hydraulic fracture propagation, but then also some interaction uh, with with uh, with the DFN. Um, so so here are the geometry of the fractures and uh, net pressures, injection net pressures. Okay, so again, summary of the old four cases showing kind of isometric view of fractured geometry or uh, geometry of the of the fractures and DFN which were stimulated. Uh, I think those are contours of, of of the apertures, and in these models, as Morillo pointed, actually are uh, uh, also include some propent placement. So these residual apertures are basically uh, due to fractures being propped by by propent. So here. Uh, the DFN geometry of DFN is kind of transparent, but then uh, uh, stimulated part uh, uh, actually has the contours of the aperture, so you can kind of get the idea. So this is case one with the kind of weakest uh, DFN, just uh, friction angle of 35 and uh, no cohesion. Now impermeable, you see that in case of impermeable, the extent stimulated of the volume uh, is smaller. Again, uh, greater friction, but the uh, permeable fractures, quite large, what would we be called stimulated rock volume? And then the case four, which I've shown you with the strongest joints. So the first question, uh, does the code simulate profit transport as a slurry, or does it simulate particles flowing in fluid, similar to the old version in coarse grid fluid scheme? Okay, I'll try to answer this question. Uh, so we don't simulate prop and transport as a, as a particles. I think that would be way too uh, uh, computationally demanding. Instead, we simulate prop and transport as uh, as a as a, a field variable as a concentration which is advected with the with the fluid flowing fluid. Okay. Um, and the other question so far uh, is what joint stiffness KN and KS values were used in the DFN example? Actually, in the in this example, and this is what we generally do in most of these problems, we basically assume that uh, normal and shear stiffness of joints is actually infinite. And I've been answering these questions over last uh, maybe a year, uh, many times to different people who used uh, Excite. So the way Excite works, if the spring is intersected by a fracture, 
then that spring represents uh, the formability of both the rock and that fracture. So, you know, the, the small rheological model of, of uh, what is happening, you know, on a scale of that spring is that you have like two springs uh, acting in series. One representing the, the formability of the, of the rock and the other representing uh, uh, the formability of the, of the joint. So basically, if the joint is present, the, the overall deformability of, the, uh, uh, of these two springs together uh, should be, should be uh, greater or stiffness should be, should be smaller. So if we completely ignore the effect of a uh, joint on the formability, we basically assume that the formability, the stiffness of that spring represents only the formability of the, of the, of the rock. And given that in most, case, in most cases, we don't have really reliable information on the formability of different fractures, I mean, joints and folds, assuming that you know they don't affect significantly overall stiffness of the of the of the rock mass on that scale is probably uh, uh, reasonable so yeah i guess to to cut the you know long as answer short in all these in this example we assume that uh, stiffness of a joint is uh, uh, infinite that they are infinitely uh stiff but we of course do consider the realistic finite strength as defined by those parameters that we listed okay thank you um we have another question um how to explain this asymmetry fracture propagation at h1s1 uh, for the base case without the DFN. Asymmetry? Great. Yeah, it's... So basically, it is explained by uh, nature of the problem, which is very re relatively unstable process, and by the stretch shadow effect, or... Uh, interaction of the of the fractures propagated from adjacent uh, clusters i know if you uh, try to solve this problem uh, using analytic solution based on continuum model uh, you you don't have mechanism to provide the, the perturbation or a source of asymmetry but in this model, which is based on some kind of uh, uh, discretization approach, if one side fractures a little bit sooner or one time step sooner than the other, that side would have a preferential uh, uh, or will be preferential direction of the fracture propagation. And I think and we believe that's how probably it happens in in the in in actual reality so yeah that's the, that's the explanation for the, for the asymmetry so once one fracture start earlier to propagate in one direction that direction then dominates uh, and creates the stress shadow which uh, uh, somehow suppresses propagation of the fracture from the adjacent clusters in the same direction but on the other hand another cluster has preferential direction or preferential direction of propagation in opposite directions so yeah that's how it happens okay um <clears throat> related to that question Um, why are three out of four clusters initiated for the base case? Which parameters control the initiation? Okay, so so this model is this model is a model of hydraulic fracture propagation on a reservoir scale. So 
we really don't solve fracture initiation. So we basically assume that it is those these are case 12 and that fracture initiates from the perforation clusters. But we assume that the model starts at the point when the where the fractures have already initiated. And we represent that with the startup joints that Morelio mentioned, which we generate through the perforation cluster, and we generate them initially in the direction perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. From that point, so we create those startup joints for every single uh, perforation mm -hmm. cluster. But then from that point on, the, the model resolves the hydraulic fracture propagation, and then how the fractures initiated from different clusters interact with each other. The next question is, uh, is the DFN permeable, and is the failure of the DFN controlled by fractured toughness or strength? Strength. So DFN is basically a, a, a strength of DFN is controlled by Coulomb slip law, characterized by a cohesion and friction angle, and then tensile strength. The fracture propagation through the intact rock is governed by a fracture toughness. Uh, what is the model size and model resolution for the DFN case? And what is the general running time? Uh, maybe, Maurilio, would you be comfortable answering this question? Yeah, this model, um, we run it in, um, in a Amazon a, a HPC center is an MPI, so it took about one day per stage. The problem is the, um, the MPI is not available for um, for um, for sale right now. But um, we, um, yeah, this, this a stage like that should run in about three four days. Um, so about um, a, um, a week and a half total. Uh, and the dimensions of the uh, the problem are showing there. So 1450. Uh, uh, Mario, do you remember what is the finest resolution in the model? Probably was about um, two meters, going okay. up to six. Okay. Okay. So with the MPI version, which isn't commercially for sale yet, it's about a day or so. Uh, and then with the PC version, which is available commercially, um, you're about a week, week and a half? Correct, yeah. Next question. Uh, I understand the pipe aperture is stress dependent. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a function of overall deformability. So it's not some kind of local relationship between uh, stress and stiffness because the aperture depends on, it's kind of, and that's one of the main reasons why this problem is is computationally very demanding. The the aperture at one point is function of low pressure changes and the formability and compliance of the entire model. So yeah, that's what the model solves. So uh, we run the mechanical model which solves the formation and the stresses the entire model, including you know changes of the apertures on the induced and pre-existing joints, and then those up to changes are used in a flow model. And then a follow-up to that question was, if so, can we implement user-defined aperture versus stress relation? No, because it's not, I mean, again, it's no local problem. I mean, uh, you can implement the user-defined contact model. You can, I mean, we don't uh, provide to uh, users, but we can implement that for the user for time being. And Marilla can maybe clarify that. So you can have a user, you quote unquote, user defined spring or contact model, but you cannot have a user defined stress aperture model because that would be correct, incorrect. Because you, you know, again, aperture is is a function of the formation of the entire model. So it's not just a local property. Yeah, the, the user context it would be pretty much you have to write your own um, C++ module and now we can load it up. It's pretty much follow the same uh, specifications as FLAC 3D or, um, or or the Itasca code. But right now the users outside Itasca cannot create their own DLL for the uh, Spring or contact model. Huh? 
Uh, yeah, for the spring, yes. Yeah, they have. Uh, we have just to load that DLL during runtime, and it's going to be available for. Uh, okay. Uh, we've got about five more questions. How can I change the unit, uh, for example, pascals to megapascals or gigapascals to reflect in the display graphs? Okay, so unlike other general purpose Itasca codes, so Excite has a built-in unit system. So you can only use two specified unit systems and you provide inputs based on what is prompted. Meaning, so you can use either metric system where you know you use meters, pascals, megapascals, and that's not hundred percent consistent. Meaning that you know in a metric system, it's not all let's say strengths or stresses are in megapascal or pascal. So it, it kind of varies. And maybe we thought because depending what how what uh, units are typically used for certain for certain parameters. For pressure, we use pascals, but then for stiffness, we use megapascal. So to avoid some numbers, which is kind of strange. So to cut, again, long story short, so we, you have two units systems. So one is metric, the other one is imperial or reservoir units, which is barrels, PSIs, and so on. But again, you can only, you have to provide units, the, the inputs in the units which are prompted from you. So, and that's indicated in the GUI, what, what units you need to provide. And the same thing with uh, with the results. So if you go to, uh, you know, reservoir units, then all results are provided in that way. So apertures are in inches, uh, um, pressures are in, in PSI and so on. Is it possible to get the orientation and shape of apertures in Excite? You can export every single micro crack. However, what we are interested in is probably the geometry of the macroscopic fractures. The problem is it's kind of complicated thing. It's not, uh, they're not planar, they're not rectangular or penny shape. And, you know, sometimes as for example, here, they kind of merge together, creating some uh, very uh, complex shape. So it's, it's very difficult to uh, somehow generalize that. So no, you cannot export geometry of the, Microscopic hydraulic fractures. You can export geometry of of every single uh, micro crack, and then if you have some other software outside, you can use that geometry to try to do the generalization. And I don't know. In some cases, depending what you're doing, I mean, you can probably approximate the fracture as a planar penny-shaped crack or a kind of rectangular fracture of a constant height. You know. But in many cases, you can't do that. So that's why we didn't even attempt to somehow do that generalization. So the uh, comment is, uh, or the question is, I see some fractures that are not hydraulically connected. What could the mechanism re be that's responsible? Um, core elasticity or something else? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, we will probably need to go and look in the detail. We have uh, total stress change due to, uh, you know, fluid injection, which could cause some uh, inelastic deformation away and creation of the fractures, which are not connected to the injection points or currently active uh, stage. And then, or, which I think is probably more important factor, which is actually, in addition, poor pressure change, which then causes fractures to slip or open or or so on. So, and, but you, you need to be careful when you look at these plots, sometimes what you see in this cross section doesn't give you entire 3D picture. So there could be connectivity that is not apparent in, in, in these cross sections. Is the DFN strength calibrated to be consistent with the strength of the rock mass, e.g. through tensile strength or shear test? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. The strength of the DFN is not necessarily correlated. Well, it could be correlated, but I'm not sure we know exactly what that correlation is. We picked realistic prop. In general, you can use whatever you want for matrix properties like the formability or the strength and similar thing for the for the joints. In this case, we kind of try to collect realistic, reasonable properties for some kind of unconventional reservoir. So, uh, I mean, they're not correlated, but you can, if you think they're correlated, you can, you know, you can correlate them. I mean, I don't know if that in any way, way affects how the model is set up or physics. 
Uh, can you simulate injection-induced fault slips and flow in faults? Fault slips? Yes, we can simulate fault slips, yeah. We can represent fluid flow in faults. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, uh, DFN fracture or fault. I mean, okay, of course, in this example, this is not realistic DFN because fractures are fairly regular in terms of orientation and, and so on. I mean, we could have put some kind of fault with some kind of, again, we can import fault geometry from uh, as output of different solid modelers and it could be complex 3D surface. And there was just a follow up to the question about unit. The user is is interested if it's possible to change the units for display purposes in the plots. For example, to display it in megapascals to avoid the, the scientific notation, just to shorten the unit. Those are uh, kind of plot attributes. I don't know, maybe Murillo can answer this, but... Currently, we, we cannot do that, no. Something for the list. Something to the list, yep. All right, well, that is all of the questions that we have now. Thank you very much, uh, everyone who joined us today. Thank you, Bronco and Murillo, for your, your presentations and answering questions. Thank you, Dave. Um, this concludes yeah, the webinar, and uh, I hope everyone has a, a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.